Hello, everyone. Good evening. If you are in uh, South Africa or the the uh, more more west of the more east of the world, actually, I hope you guys are all well. Welcome to this Comrades Marathon Women's Webinar. Uh, really, really excited for the, for this today. I see they have a couple of people already with us. Um, some people from Cape Town. I see some Piwes from Johannesburg. Carmelitas from Cape Town. She's running her third Comrades, but of course, for many people, it's their first up run. Um, I saw that there was uh, Chelsea, who was from Switzerland, which is amazing. So she's just completed her first Oceans and now looking to complete her first Comrades in June. Um, so yeah, really, really looking forward to this. I'm very excited to have um, some cool people with us today to, to help us host this. Uh, and of course, guys, if you have questions, keep them coming in the comments. We'll try and answer as, as many as we can during the presentation, but we'll definitely stick around and have a nice Q&A afterwards. Okay. So let's uh, let's just get cracking with some introductions. Just if you don't know who I am, and you're normally used to seeing uh, two men on this uh, on the screens here, Lindsay and Brad. Um, it's an it's a it's an all female affair tonight uh, with with uh, Sophia, <laughs> with a six, except for Sofiso, who's here representing comrades. But let me just do some introductions. So if you don't know me, my name is Shona Hendricks. I'm a former head of sports science at the University of Pretoria. I have a postgraduate degree in sports science. I have an MBA, and I'm also a certified strength and conditioning specialist. I'm the creator of the Running Through Menopause Training Framework and also a runner and triathlete, crazy athlete like you guys as well. I've done a couple of international marathons, um, including Berlin, Chicago, Amsterdam, and New York. Currently in London, getting ready for the London Marathon on Sunday. And I've done a, dabbled in a few uh, ultra marathons um, and, and a couple of half distance uh, triathlons as well. Uh, we also have Doc Pato uh, Zondi with us. Uh, Doc is uh, uh, an esteemed uh, colleague and friend of mine. Um, so she is part of the medical team for the All Africa Games in 2024. She served as the chief medical officer for Team South Africa at the Commonwealth, at, at the Olympics, and at the Paralympic Games. She was invited by the International Olympic Committee to help train sports medicine physicians and team doctors from around the world. And she serves as an expert advisor to the Virgin Act of South Africa on women's health. Um, not only is she brilliant uh, at her job, she is also an athlete as well. She has taken part in the world's toughest epic uh, eight-day cycle race, the Cape Epic. Uh, she is also a comrades runner. That's not mentioned there, and she's uh, hoping to to get a back-to-back -back as well. Doc, welcome. Uh, nice to have you here um, as well. She's been traveling about. Um, just check that you're muted, Doc. Let's just make sure your tech is all working. It's great to be here, Shona. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Doc. Uh, good. And then uh, we have Safiso with us. So thanks, Safiso, for joining the ladies tonight. He's the marketing coordinator for the Comrades Marathon. He has been an MC of, of the Stomp Awards in Cape Town. He is also the assistant race director for the Peter Maritzburg City Marathon and a race director of the Green Trail Run. So great to have you here, Safiso, as well. Uh, and Safiso is just going to be talking about some of our charity stuff, uh, that will Comrades charity work, which is really, really important. And they've made some amazing strides there. So I'll hand over to Safiso in just a bit, and then we'll get cracking into some of the coaching and, and, and medical aspects um, of of this uh, uh, webinar. So let me just get Safiso's slides going here and we will hand over to Safiso in just a little bit. Um, all right, Safiso, I'm gonna hand over to you. I will jump off screen and uh, yeah, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Thank you, thank you so much, Shona. Um, good evening to everyone from all, all over the world. Um, just, uh, just for tonight, a disclaimer, I uh, would be identifying as a female um because it's a it's it's a ladies webinar so um just for tonight after after nine then i'll go back to being a mister just for now i'll be a miss Mgoma. um my talk today is going to be based on our charities um and then shortly a few things that you need to know and some interesting things that you need to do or have as a runner or a comrade entrance for 2024. um we Comrades Marathon has a, an AmaBDBD arm or a charity arm, which is called AmaBDBD. This was established in 1996, and ever since this um, charity arm was established, we have raised over 70, over 71 million rand thanks to the runners and the donors that support our charities for us to accumulate and reach um, this mileage um there are a couple of ways as a runner that you can assist to raise funds for our charities um 
you one is by uh, buying any items. Uh, you will see we will have we normally have a charity stand at the expo where we house all our six official charities. Um, you can buy anything from them or you can make donation. I think when you were entering, you had um, an option where you were asked if you would like to donate to any of our official charities or um, sign up to raise funds for them. I will explain um, how you can sign up just, um, just after the slide. Um, the second option you can support our charities is, is a race for charity whereby you sign up and raise funds for them. And the last option is the Toyota win a car competition, which will be towards um, the end of our charity uh, presentation. And then these are our six official charities, um, Community Chest, Child Line KZN, South African National Parks, Honorary Rangers, Hillcrest Aid Centre Trust, Rise Against Hunger, and Childhood Cancer Foundation South Africa. So these charities are focused on various facets um, of social and environmental um, upliftment, from early childhood development, wildlife and environmental awareness, conservation and of protected areas, issues of gender-based violence and child abuse. Um, and then a, a, a childhood cancer and HIV AIDS support. So um, as I've said, these are the official charities. Um, this, this few slides explain the work they do and the visuals of the, of the work they do in, the, in our community that I've just explained um, just now. So um, here are the few benefits that as a runner, when you sign up to raise funds for our charities that you can, um, um, that what you stand to, to benefit. One um, is it's merely contributing to a worthy cause that you feel passionate about. We all passionate about something or one thing or the other. Um, I'm sure amongst these six official charities, if you look at the work that they do, they are doing some amazing work uh, on our communities. Some, uh, some of us have um, directly been affected by the issues that they are dealing with or the things that are helping people who are dealing with, like your HIV AIDS, your cancer, childhood cancer, um, and, and so forth. So number two, once you have committed to raise funds for, for the charity, you will receive support and some uh, encouragement. I will show you a bit later on my presentation because um, when people basically, when they um, when they chip in some funds and in support of your race for charity, they do have an option to write some short messages, some sweet messages that will keep you, um, you know, that will keep you on the road to give you some words of encouragement. Number three, um, charities have created this sort of tradition whereby they welcome people who raise funds for them with a gift that um, that 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 will be um, determined by each of um, of the charity. Um, so if you raise funds when you come to the expo, you go see the charity that you raise funds for. They always have something for you, just as a token of appreciation. And then number four. As Comrades Marathon Association, we reserve 500 spaces on CBEG for runners um, that, that are able to collect a minimum of 6,000 rand. The, the, the only thing about this one, in order to improve your seeding or in order to qualify to start on CBEG by, uh, by raising a minimum of 6,000 rand, you will need to have raised 6,000 rand by the 6th of May. So if you haven't signed up, um, to raise funds for our charity and you wish to improve your seeding through this initiative, you literally have three weeks, um, uh, two weeks and a half from now to, to be able to raise 6,000 rand, then, he, um, then you can um, improve your seeding without going, um, on, uh, without going um, to events and trying to upgrade or run your BPs and whatnot. So this is a perfect opportunity for you um, please note, you still need to do a bare minimum of requirement, which is a sub 450 on a standard marathon. Um, it doesn't mean that if you have raised a 6,000 run, then you, um, you don't have to run your qualifier. You still need to go run your qualifier. You can run it at a bare minimum of 450, then you can improve your seeding by raising funds for our charity. And last but not least, 
You know, Comrades Marathon is very tough. Um, so your training and, and, and your supplements can only take you up to certain kilometers on race day. So if you need an extra motiva uh, motivation, raising funds for our charity will help you dig deep into, into that sense of purpose that you are not just uh, doing this run or completing Comrades Marathon just for you only. By completing Comrades Marathon, the, you are making a difference um, in one way or the other, in communities or it could be um, a kids if you are raising funds for charities that deal with kids or any charity that you are raising funds for. So those are the few benefits that you get as a runner by signing up and raising funds for our charities. Uh, how do you sign up as a runner if you wish to sign up and assist our charities? You simply need to go to your EasyRage profile. You can either go to your Comrades app and click on sign in. You will be redirected to this page where it says EasyRage. You click on login. Once you click on login, you put in your email address, the password that you've created when you were um, uh, setting up your entry. And then once you are logged into your profile, you can go to your Comrades entry excuse me, and go to dashboard. Once you are on your Comrades Entry dashboard, if you scroll down, you will see um, this option here which says join race, um, re join race for Charity. All you need to do is simply click on that green button. Once you click on it, you will get a, a, a message which will ask you, if you to confirm if you really want to raise funds for Charity. You say yes. Once you press yes, there will be four things that will be required out of you. You, one, you upload a profile picture or, of yourself or any image that you wish to appear on your fundraising profile. Number two, if you click on that drop down on that second space there, you, um, the, um, you, you will be able to select uh, one of the six official charities that I've just mentioned. And then below that, you can write in a short message, why is the charity close to your heart or why do you want to raise funds for that particular charity? And then below that um, is the most important part where you set your target. When you set your target, um, you can put as 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 uh, 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 any amount that you wish to to put. That could be a million rand, it could be ten thousand, it could be six thousand rand. Any amount that you think you'll be able to achieve. Also, if you don't achieve the amount that or the target that you've set, um, you set um, you set yourself up to raise. It doesn't matter you can go over and, and beyond your target or you can raise below. All that matters is that you are making a difference um, in um, um, in the charity, for the charities that you are raising funds for. And then um, there is there a question, that's a yes or no question that is there at the bottom. Um, I always urge people to press on yes so that um, ch a charity that you are raising funds for will be able to contact you. Then you press uh, save. Once you press save, uh, your name will appear on the list of runners who are raising funds for our charities on our website. So once your name is there, it will show um, your profile picture, the name of the charity that you are raising funds for. And then it shows your target, how much you wish to raise. If you have started fundraising, it will show how much we have raised so far. For instance, the gentleman who is um, uh, leading right now, Anathan Chelsea, raising funds for chalk. He has raised uh, just over 41,000 rand. His target was 6,000 rand, but um, he has been, um, he reached his target and then he went way beyond what he has thought he, um, he would be able to raise. So uh, this is exactly what I was explaining earlier, that it doesn't matter what, what target you set up, you can always go beyond, or if you, can, um, if you can't reach your target, there is no shame in that. So at the moment, we are currently sitting at um, just over 1.7 1, 1 million um, on Race for Charity. So uh, if, if you can assist or if you can sign in, our target is 7 million. We are still a bit far with our target um, um, collectively with our charities. So we really need you guys to sign up and assist us to reach that target. Um, and then... Um, what will it cost you as a runner? Um, not so much. I know they say time is money and somehow 
people find that synonymous, but you will not need to go to your wallet for that one. You really need some time um, to, to, to ask people to assist with your fundraising. Um, you really need, uh, it will cost you your love, your patience, and the sheer will to assist where you can and to make a difference um, to people that can never repay you. What is expected of you once you have registered? Um, it, it, it's a matter of just sharing your link with people who, um, who you deem will be able to assist you with your fundraising. You can um, share your link via email. You can share it on Facebook or Twitter, which is now X, former Twitter, which is now X. Um, or you can copy a link and share it on WhatsApp with your friends or anyone or company that, um, that you think will be able to assist you um, with your fundraising. If someone is chipping funds on your, on your charity, um, they simply click on donate um, and put in the amount that they want to assist you with. For instance, down there, there is a gentleman who donated 500 rand and then they wrote a message, all the best. And then they, they, you can see their name below that. So um, anyone who assists you with your fundraising can either choose to put in their name or they can be anonymous as well. Uh, the last option, how you can assist our charity. Um, we have the cheapest car in South Africa. We have a car available, available for 50 Rand. All you need to do to get this car, you simply buy a ticket, a raffle ticket from our charities which is 50 Rand, as it says there, a car for 50 Rand. Um, or you can go to Comrade's website and click on charities. There is a win a car tab there. If you click on there, you will see a link where you can uh, purchase tickets online. You can buy as many tickets as you like to maximize your chances um, of winning on race day. The draw will be on race day at quarter to five. Doesn't matter whether you are a runner or a non-runner. Um, you all you need to. All, um, the only important rule on this competition is that you need to be a South African or you need to live within South African borders. Um, so um, if you win and let's say you stay in Cape Town, um, we will call you after the race and then we will deliver the car on the nearest Toyota dealership where we will do the official handover. So take your chances. You might um, not win the race on race day, but go home with a, um, a, a brand new Corolla Cross. Um, uh, um, that we, um, moving forward um, over and above our charities, just a few reminders on our Comrades Expo. Um, those are the dates of our expo. If you are an exhibitor or you wish to exhibit, we still have stands available. Um, the packages are available. You can see we start from 28,400 going up, uh, or 19,000 actually, 750 going up. And then pa um, packages differ depending on the size of stand that you take. Um, they are custom made, um, also um, stand design. You can contact our, um, our, our uh, Liesl at uh, hgexport.com. Um, .co.za. Information uh, is available on our website under our events. You can contact us and get a stand. Otherwise, for you runners, um, we will open the official registration on Thursday at 10 at 10 a.m. and close uh, at 7 p.m. On Friday, we will open a bit early at 9 and close at 7 p.m. On Saturday, we open at 9 and close a bit early at 4. So, if you are not staying in Pizza Maritzburg or in, in, in Durban, uh, please make sure that you make your way to, um, to the registration as early as you can or before we close our expo because you don't want to train um, all the year and then uh, book your accommodation, pay for entry fee and qualify and then only miss your race just by not making it on time at the expo. Once we close the expo, you will not be able to get your race number. As soon as we close the expo, we pick all the numbers that are not collected in a truck, lock the truck, drive the truck and, and park it at Comrade House in Peter Maritzburg. So there will be no one who can be able to assist. Even if you have my personal number, Unfortunately, at that time of the of the day, I, I cannot assist even if I like because it's just crazy. We are too busy to um, attend to such things. So we really urge runners to may if you know that you won't be able to make it on time, please make means um, on time. 
to arrange for someone to collect for you. Information will be um, shared on our socials and on your on your final um, on your final um, instruction race instruction uh, how you can make those arrangements. But you need to make those arrangements prior prior to day, not on the last minute dot com. Um, before we go to the end of my of my presentation, they, there is just one thing that I uh, wanted uh, our runners, which is important for us to to do. Um, we are lucky to have so many sponsors as Comprehensive Marathon. Um, this um, what you are seeing here on the screen right now is from one of our sponsors, which is Netcare. Um, I will just read through. Um, for you, time matters. You meticulously time uh, your training, your distance, your pace, and your race and every second counts as you strive towards the finish line. For us, time matters as much because in an emergency, every second counts. So um, Netcare 911, which is Comrade Sponsor, um, have developed an app where they can assist you in case of emergency. Um, so we really urge runners to download this app um, which can track you on, on real time. And will be, um, if you have any problem on race day and you need a medical assistance, you can just log into your app and, 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 and click on us on, 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 on where you, um, on where you need to click to get assistance. Then they will be able to provide you with, um, with, um, the assistance that you need at, at as early as possible you can use this app on race day while training or any time of the day it doesn't have to use it once when it's comrade so the app is available on on, on um, apple store google play and um an app gallery please download that app if you have any problem even while you're training once if you have this app they will be able to locate you and assist you um i this is the end of my presentation. I would have liked to say break a leg, but you ladies will need your legs on race day. So I will stick on good luck. Please follow us on our socials so that you can be updated on what's happening, where we are with the, with the race planning. Um, that's it for me tonight. Thank you so much. Enjoy your evening. Thank you so much, Sofiso, for all of that information. Really, really appreciate you you being here. So uh, representing the gents for us tonight. So thanks, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate it. <clears throat> all right, guys. So let's uh, let's get into the the nuts and bolts of of all of this. Um, so if you happen to miss the first uh, women's webinar, go back and have a look. It's on the um, official coach comrades coach YouTube page. Uh, all the previous ones, and in that previous one. Uh, Nikki, um, the resident uh, comrades dietitian, she she was on and she did a whole lot around nutrition. Tonight, obviously, uh, I will present a little bit around, sorry, and on that previous one, I spoke a lot more around uh, menstrual cycles and, and how we adjust training accordingly. I also did quite a bit on strength training. Um, tonight, though, we're going to just touch base on where we should be essentially from a coaching perspective, a training perspective. Um, I will speak a little bit around um, breast health. I'll speak a little bit around the pelvic floor um, and, and, and issues there. And then obviously we've got Doc Patel with us as well, who will, who will touch on some medical concerns as well. So, so keep questions coming. Uh, I will get to those uh, at the end. We'll flag some of them and, and answer one or two afterwards. Um, but then we'll definitely stick around for a QA and a um, long after as well. Okay, so keep those coming. Um, being that this is a, a women's uh, or, or a lady seminar, a women's seminar, I wanted to to touch on on on, on some aspects. And I think uh, this is quite funny. This is a funny story. I actually had this poster up on my um, wall when I was a little girl, <laughs> and I scanned it and I've kept it. And and it just it's so funny how it still resonates to this day. Um, and so uh, yeah, it says there who who are your heroes. Uh, did you name an actor? Did you name an athlete? Did you name a woman? Did you name any woman? And it says there, why don't we think of women as heroes? Maybe it's because no one ever shows them to us, right? We never actually get to see them. We don't take the time to find them, to celebrate them, and to make sure these, these heroes are seen so that we can find the inspiration to achieve whatever we dream. And I absolutely love this last bit. It says, look around. We're surrounded by strong, courageous, accomplished women. Any one of them could be a hero, or a hero could be you. And if I think back to uh, to 
to the comrades. I mean, definitely one of our heroes. And then from a South African perspective, Caroline Wasman, I think she she definitely uh, sort of drove the or opened up the field for for South African women in in running, and 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 definitely was quite inspirational. And I see her as one of my heroes, and I know she definitely went on, um, and and um, inspired our current race director Anne um, Ashworth into her first win. And I think that's just opened up the field, and and I think we always need to keep looking at these heroes um, over and over again. Uh, obviously, we have tons of these heroes, um, and and Gerda just went and had a, a blitzing run as well as a vet uh, at at Oceans already, and so they are all of these heroes um, to have a look at already. But but there's also these everyday heroes, right? And 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 um, uh, there's I think Sienda's actually in the in the in the crowd with us tonight, and there she is in the in the top left corner. Uh, these are a couple of our, our um, Coach Perry members, but tons of you guys who've run comrades um, already, and I know we were. We're lucky enough um, to have Cindy on with us as well in the Fat Cats um, workout um, uh, outfit there as well. So, so many heroes within, within you know, our comrade sphere and within our women's running. And so I just, you know, wanted to, to touch on the fact that we can all inspire each other to be phenomenal runners. And so this could be you, right? We really, really want you to, to be crossing the finish line. And whether you'll cross in first, second, or third place, like our, our, our first, second, and third last year, um, I mean, maybe you'll be a, the, the latest uh, Caroline. But, but at the end of the day, what we really, really want is that has to be you. At the end of the race, you have to be crossing that finish line. Comrades Marathon Association, Coach Perry, uh, the official Comrades Coach Lindsay, we want you to, to cross the finish line. And so that is why we host these webinars and seminars and, and, and uh, you know, roadshows and all the rest. We want you to, to be that person crossing the line, exhilarated and, and, and full, of, full of joy from the day. So... The app run. We didn't go into a lot of detail on this um, in our last ladies webinar or women's webinar. Um, and so let's just go into a little bit of detail about the app run. Many of us, while you may not be a comrades novice, you probably are a, a, or you could be an app run novice because we haven't run the app run in, in, a, in a very long time. Um, and so it's really, I think it is quite nerve wracking. And, and now you really are in your, in your, in your peak kind of training, right? So um, going through a bit of the route, um, you know, you as we start, you really are quite. Uh, the comrades don't really give you a bit of an uh, like an opportunity to realize that you're in the upper. And after about six or seven hundred meters, you already start turning onto the ramp on uh, to get onto the highway. And then you you already know that we, we're heading into this uh, this up run for the year. And about five k's into that, uh, you'll probably be hitting around a Tollgate Bridge, and that is, is is really one of your first climbs. And and you know, really, the first 37 kilometers of this race are probably, from what I hear, is the is the hardest 37 kilometers of uh, kilometers of any race you're going to land up doing. Um, and so, once you get after about five k's, you're going to keep climbing seven kilometers around the seven kilometer mark. You'll get to 45th cutting. It is not one of the official big five, um, and I think I have the big five over over here. I just want to see, yeah. So we'll go through those right in terms of a lot more detail. You've got your big five hills. And then, of course, there's the many unnamed hills, right? So Tollgate being one of them around the 5K mark, 45th cutting around the 7K mark as well. Um, and, and then from there, you, you will just keep climbing up towards Westville. Um, and around nine kilometers, you'll be climbing around the outskirts of Pine Town. From there, you get your first hill, your, your first of the big five, Cowie's Hill, okay, at around 17 kilometers. It's a little bit more gradual than most of the hills. Um, and then from there, you're going to get into the, the, the next of the big five, which is, which is Fields Hill. So Cowboys Hill and Fields Hill are quite close together, right, being at 17 and around 23 kilometers mark. Um, Fields Hill is, it's long. It's one of the longer ones, but it's really not one of the more um, sort of uh, steepish ones, right? It, it, it doesn't really flatten out, though, so it just feels like it's just um, relentless and, and continuing. And from there we carry on climbing and climbing, and then we get to to both both his hill. Sorry, not not both his hill. We're we're in Durban now, so both his hill, um, and and this is really going to be your steepest of all the the big five climbs. Okay, it's not your longest, but it is the steepest. Now you're feeling okay. We've been climbing for for 37 kilometers, right? And if I look at this this uh, this map over here, you can see that's not this is actually the GPX file, so it is a little bit more to scale. And by 37 kilometers, you're probably going, oh gosh, I know, like that is a lot of a lot of climbing, and it is. But 
luckily around the 39k mark we start getting a lot more of the of the here so for our international people listening a lot of the uh, atmosphere and crowd support um you pass Kersney college and i know the school tends to come out uh, and and there's a lot of supports along the roads from here you'll get up towards inchunga um which is the 48 to 50 kilometer mark and and uh, yeah you're looking at around three to six kilometers and that's a lot a lot of climbing and 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 by this point you're probably also going to be feeling you know really like you've just been climbing all day but at around the 50k mark you'll also pass oh gosh and i and i forget the name of the school every single time i talk about this uh but it's a special needs school and just the 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 passion and the environment of of running and and uh and and being able to run and having the privilege to run uh the support from the school is unbelievable so really at this point in the race take all of that atmosphere and allow that to help pull you up as you go over these hills all right, so now you've done a lot of this climbing. It does start to feel like you're running downhill a little bit from here, right? So if I just go back to this map, it does start to feel like you, you're doing a little bit of downhill running, okay? But it, it doesn't really end there. So just be careful about that, that essentially your highest point within the race is Umlas Road, okay? Uh, and that is, you know, a, a little bit later on in the race. And, and that is where once you, most of your uphills are done from that point, okay? We always give uh, runners this warning that uh, as you're starting to get towards the end of the race, you will hit little pollies and everyone will sort of go, but because, because you've been running for so long now, you're on tired legs, you're going to think that that is actually poly shorts, right? But if it is less than a kilometer, it is not poly shorts, okay? So that is that is one of the key things is that you're going to think it's pollies, but little pollies in a kilometer um, uh, in terms of, of the length of the run. So once you get to polys, you probably have, I know the route might have changed slightly. I know there's a new finish line, so but you probably have between eight and nine and a half kilometers to go. Um, don't try and be a, a hero and run all the way up polys. Make sure you do a nice run walk up polys. You are going to be tired. You do have tired legs and you want to be able to run the last eight or so kilometers into the finish line. From what I understand about the finish line, it is a, an, a, a slightly, I want to say, faster finish line in that the, the guys have really made it nice for the spectators as well as um, for the runners as well. So, so be careful not to run all the way up polys. I know Lindsay, Coach Lindsay always tells a story about how he thought he would uh, run all the way up polys and he felt like uh, there was a sniper mm -hmm. who took out his calf and he just could not run the last eight kilometers. So try not to to necessarily be a hero there, make sure you run, walk up polys and so that you can tackle this race in exactly the right sort of way. Okay. So where are we now, right? We have 53 days to go, if I'm not mistaken. I hope I've calculated that correctly. And so we really are into the business end of our comrades training, okay? You're probably hitting some of your biggest miles in and around this time. You've done, if you've not done a long run already, you probably have, and, you, and you're coming up to your, your last long run. Um, and, and, and the key here now is that we really want to be focusing on staying injury-free and illness-free. And how do we do that? One of the ways in which we do that is we, we don't want to be cramming in sessions. You don't want to act like you haven't studied for your exam and start cramming everything in. That is just going to put you at extra risk of injury. It's going to put you at extra risk of, in, of, of illness as well. And as you guys know, if you've followed any of these webinars, <clears throat> excuse me, or um, any of the webinars, any of the road shows, you will know that if, if you arrive at Comrade Race Day with an injury, we've done a survey before where 68% of the runners who arrive at Comrades Race Day with an injury don't finish. So don't risk trying to cram in extra sessions over and over now because you're worried about your fitness and putting yourself at risk of an injury. You've got less chance of finishing this race if you start the race with an injury. We want you to be fresh, all right? We want you to be fit for race day, but we really, really want you to be fresh for race day as well. So don't cram in sessions, focus on staying injury free. And obviously as, as seasons are changing now, I know it's getting slightly colder in South Africa at the moment. And if you are international, seasons are changing. I'm in London at the moment, the weather's doing some crazy, crazy things. We want you to try and stay illness free as well. So you can maximize the last little bit of training that you are doing. All right, so where are we now? What are we actually doing for the month of April? Right, if you're on the finishers medal, you are probably hitting around 50 to, to 65 kilometers a week. Um, you may 
sort of step out of that in, in one of the weeks where you're getting a longer run. Um, and that is true for all of all of the medals. Um, bronze medalists, if that's what you're aiming for, you, you're aiming, you probably are hitting around 65 to 70 kilometers a week. Robert Machali is around 70 to 75 kilometers. Bill Rones, uh, 90 to 100 kilometers. And then I'm very happy to say this, that Silver, it doesn't have to say Silver slash Isabel Rush Kelly. So that, if you haven't heard, has changed. That's, um, it is no longer seven hours 30 for the Isabel Rush Kelly. It's sub seven. So silver medals uh, for male and female, which is excellent. And as Lindsay always says, these are the people who really, really don't like their family and friends. And so they're hitting 100 to 130 kilometers a week. As we move forward into our last big month of, of, of well, half a big month, a big block of training, let me not say month because we're not necessarily working on calendar months. Um, as we move forward towards that, we also will start tapering a little bit. So you'll see that these might be a little bit less. Um, and just again, just to mention here with where we are now, across the board, you're probably getting one of your longest runs in um, uh, in this in this point in time, which might throw uh, those numbers out. Also really important, let me say this, is that, Guys, if you haven't hit these numbers, okay, so if you're not in anywhere near these numbers, that doesn't mean to say that you must now suddenly jump outside and go, awesome, I'm going to go out and run 50Ks this week, okay? That is going to put you at a risk of injury. These are just um, an idea of where you should be. And obviously, if you've been following along with the plans, um, it's just giving you an idea of, of where you should. Don't jump up into these if that's not what you have been doing or if you've been injured, et cetera. Rather build up progressively. As we get closer to, to, to race day and, and into May, um, you'll see that those numbers come down quite a bit, obviously, because as we're getting into May, we will start tapering uh, before the race towards the end of May. Um, and so the finishers, you're looking around 40 to 50K per week. Uh, same for bronze, 40 to 50K. But Robert Machali is around 50 to 60 kilometers. Bill Rones, uh, 60 to 70. And then your silvers, 80 to 100 kilometers a week. Okay, so again, guys, just those are, uh, you know, sort of round numbers. They're not absolute definitives that you have to get to. Don't jump there if that's not what you have been doing. All right, the long run. So let's let's chat a little bit about that. Uh, obviously, there's there's a big tradition around comrades and, and getting in that one maximum run. And, and those can vary, right? I've, I've heard people running things like 60 to 65 kilometer runs. Um, other people are doing 40 to 50 kilometer runs. So how long is long enough? And and really, if we understand the point of why this long run is there, we can then re move into what is important or how much is enough. And with most of your, your ultras or marathons, you'll, you will tend to do a long run, ideally normally four weeks, three to four weeks before your race. But because Comrades is 89 kilometers. We don't want to do that long run three to four weeks before the race because then we won't recover in time in order to perform well on race day. And um, and so really this this long run has has developed into becoming quite a mental uh, um, aspect for for runners, ensuring you know okay, well, can I do that distance? Can I you know get all of these things in um, you know practicing my nutrition, doing all of all of those sorts of aspects. And so I see the value in it from that perspective. But we have to essentially start trading off from a long run perspective when we're doing it. So we're getting the benefit. So it's close enough to race day, but not too close to race day that we have to recover too much. You know, so we don't want to do a long run that's that's too long so that we have to do extra recovery and really sacrifice training again, because if we're running when we're not recovered enough, we're going to risk injury and we don't want to risk injury. So how long is long enough? That's uh, that's going to depend really on, on a number of things. But for the most part, I know that uh, the official comrades coach, Lindsay, really doesn't want you doing longer than a 50 to 55 kilometer run in general. If you've just done two oceans this, this past weekend, um, that is a 56 kilometer kilometer run. It's funny how we often don't think that we're like, oh, it's just two oceans. It's not, it's not, you know, but it's 56 kilometers. So two oceans will essentially serve as your longest run. And uh, you can then go and do what we know as our normal comrades long run or the club, the club runs um, you, on the 5th of May, that weekend of the 4th and 5th of May. And then if you've done two oceans and you've done two oceans easy, you would then look to do that, um, Comrades long run or the, your club run on the 4th or 5th of May. And, and I would suggest doing a maximum of 40 kilometers in that run, 35 to 40 kilometers, maybe depending if you're on the slightly faster end of the medals, up to 45 kilometers in that run. 
if you ran to oceans and you ran to oceans hard and you're sore, I mean, we're Wednesday post uh, race and you're still sore, make sure that you are getting enough recovery in before you start training again. Um, and then really, really minimize that, that last long run um, in terms of the distance that you're doing. Okay. What do you want to do in this long run? What are the things we, we really want to check? Yes, it's a mental booster. Yes, it helps you, uh, you know, get an idea of, of, of I can do this, you know, like uh, build some positivity. But this really is your dress rehearsal for comrades. Okay, so it's an amazing opportunity to check all of your gear. Okay, so I'm going to touch on sports bras in a little bit. And, uh, you know, maybe this is an opportunity in your last long run to, to make sure you've got the right sports bra that it's not chafing you anywhere. And if it is chafing you, to know, okay, on race day, I need to make sure that I'm putting a little bit more anti-chafe cream or Vaseline in the right sort of places. Um, try out all of your gear, right? So from your sunglasses and your, your cap um, all the way down to your shoes. So let's let's go through that. Sunglasses, cap, sunscreen, making sure that the sunscreen that you use doesn't burn your eyes when you start sweating. Um, I use a SPF in my, my daily moisturizer, but it burns my eyes when running. So I use a different sunscreen for when I'm running, right? Moving all the way down. Sports bra. Is the sports bra comfortable? Is it going to touch into all the things I'm going to talk on in a little bit later? Is it does it cause any chafe? Um, does your, your running vest cause chafe? So you might be doing your long runs, your training runs in a normal training shirt, but you're more than likely going to be running in your in your club vest. So make sure that you do this long run in your club vest to get a really good idea. Uh, all the way down into our shorts and our tights, whatever we're using, um, and into socks and obviously our running and our running shoes. Okay. Lindsay comes up in a, and when he spoke about this on one of the road shows, I love it because he spoke around making a checklist. So uh, make this checklist before your long run. Okay. So go before your long run, create a checklist, head to toe of what you need, uh, of your nutrition, of what you're going to take when, and make sure that you tick those off because on race morning, you are going to be so nervous, especially if you're a novice, you're going to be so nervous that you're going to forget to put extra Vaseline in those really hard to reach places and you are going to chafe. So make sure you go through that entire checklist. If you live outside of Durban um, or outside of South Africa, if you have to travel into the race, make sure you have this checklist as well, because that's going to be your guide for packing. OK, you don't want to get to to comrades and, and, and race week and not have your pair of shoes or the right pair of socks or whatever you need. So that is really, really important. I flew to London. I'm running London on Sunday. My luggage went missing, um, but I had my running shoes and my nutrition and my kits in my hand luggage. So I have a friend who's also running comrades who traveled from Joburg to Durban and had her her, right, her comrades' kits with her in another bag. Okay, so it sounds ridiculous, but I think it's really, really um, good ideas. And just go through those checklists, uh, you know, militantly almost, so that you you have a really good idea what you need to do in your long run. You've practiced all of that. So that is your dress rehearsal for your race day. Okay. So let's get into some of the topics um, specific to women. Mm. As I mentioned, if you missed the last women's webinar, we touched on menstrual cycles, we touched on strength training, bone health, muscle mass, and, and you can go and find that as, as a replay. But one of the things that we've picked up quite a bit, and or I just see when I'm running on the road, um, is, is, is that women aren't running in the correct bras. And there is a little bit of research and, and, and science on this, which I find quite interesting. But essentially, 30 to 40% of female runners experience breast pain, but, but they don't do anything about it. So I, I, I think women have just got this ability to shut things out and continue, right? Which isn't always necessarily a good thing. And, and so from one perspective, we're not looking after our, the, the health of our breasts by running in poor sports bras. Aside from the pain, it also has a performance decrement if you're not running in, in, in the correct sports bra. And there are studies that show that there is 10 to 12 centimeters of movement, okay, regardless of your running pace, okay? So whether you're a slow runner or a fast runner, you can have 10 to 12 centimeters of movement while we're running. Now, how does that affect uh, our performance? right? We're running forward. We want to be as efficient while we're running forward as we can. And so movement side to side or up and down is going to affect that running forward movement or the efficiency of that. And essentially what that equates to, that 10 to 12 centimeters equates to this. So imagine that there's two shoners, 
who are both physiologically exactly the same, right? So Shona 1 and Shona 2, they, they, there's no difference in their genetics. They should run exactly the same time. They have the same shoes. They have the same everything. Shona 1 has a really, really good sports bra, and Shona 2 doesn't. What that means is that Shona 1 will finish one and a half kilometers ahead of Shona 2 in a marathon. One and a half kilometers, right? That is that is a lot. And that is from your sports bra. So if you're not necessarily wearing the correct sports bra, not only is it not good for the, the health of your breasts, but it's also going to give you, you know, those small little gains that we're constantly speaking about um, with, yeah, with, with running and trying to get it better and stronger. And so what is a good sports bra? What are we looking for here? There are a couple of things. There are different types of sports bras. There's bras that are compression bras and there's bras that are encapsulation. So they have cups. Um, the general recommendation is that if you are a, a, a small, a, a mid, mid C cup, you can use a compression bra. If you are a, a C cup and up, you should be using a bra that is, that is encapsulation, that has cups. And ideally, we want bras that are able to adjust around the waist and on the strap, ideally, okay? You don't want the chest band being too large, right? And the cups are being too small. And so if you do a little test, you should be able to slide one to two fingers under your bra strap over here, and that shouldn't be too tight. If it is too loose, it's going to start riding up at the back. Um, and all the females I ever know do this, right? We don't want to just tighten the straps and make them as tight as we can because we think that's going to hold everything in, right? Don't just tighten those straps to make sure that everything is secure. We want to make sure that we are fitted correctly. Um, of course, if there is, is bulge of the breast coming out, that cup is going to be too small for, is too small for you. If there are wrinkles in the, in the bra itself, that bra is too big. And so I really, really highly recommend that you go and get yourself fitted for a bra. There's a company um, that does these fittings. They are expensive. I'm not going to lie to you, but they are brilliant. I know those bras last for years, and I definitely know that um, most uh, females don't mind, or most runners don't mind spending thousands of brands on shoes that last three months, but we're not willing to spend this amount of money and looking after our breast health as well. Okay, so so definitely go and look at something like that, ladies. It, those bras do last, and it's 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 vital for your breast health. Um, ladies, just to say, if there are any questions, please pop them into the chat. Uh, I will answer some of them at the end, uh, if not at the end in the Q and A as well. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about our pelvic floor, uh, and and really, if I can be frank about it, leaking urine while we are running. Um, no one wants to talk about it because I know it's a bit taboo. It seems a bit like, ah, that's a bit embarrassing. I, I leak urine when I'm running. But but you know how many of my, my female clients tell me that this happens? So we know it happens. But guys, I, I, I definitely just need you to know this, that it's, it's, it's a very common thing, but it doesn't mean that that is normal. Okay, so, uh, you know, just, just try to hide that and, and, and wear black tights and, and make sure that that doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that it's normal. It can be common, um, and it's very common, of course, if you are postnatal, so if you've had a baby, um, and, and if you're going through peri- and postmenopause, it is as well. So if you're going through menopause, there is a loss of muscle strength. The pelvic floor is muscle, right? So we lose muscle strength, and uh, that will change the integrity of, of uh, your pelvic floor and how that works. Um, if you have had a baby, that, of course, will change the integrity of that pelvic floor as well. So um, that happens as we age, and that does, of course, lead to things like incontinence and, and, and leaking urine while we're running and trying to exercise and so on. Um, we must understand, though, that it's not just about if you do struggle with this. I'm sure someone has told you that, ah, oh, just do some Kegels, just do some little strengthening exercises while you're sitting at your desk, um, and it's not just about that. It is really about how your, your pelvic floor functions with your diaphragm and with the deep core muscles within your trunk, okay? Every single person who, who has some sort of pelvic floor concern or incontinence will have a different reason for it. And so just giving a blanket, blanket response around going, do some strengthening is not going to work, 
right? If you've ever had a glutes issue, right, like a piriformis issue, very often in your glutes, that is an, a, a weakness and a tightness. So very often the, the muscle's weak, but it's very, very tight. And we need to loosen that muscle before we can strengthen it. And sometimes that can be the case within a pelvic floor concern and, and incontinence concerns as well. And so just doing extra strengthening in Kegels does not help make that any better. In actual fact, it just makes that area tighter and tighter, which affects the way the diaphragm and the pelvic floor work together, which is just going to make this issue uh, even worse. And so if you are struggling um, with this, my advice to you is to go and see a pelvic health specialist, right? I know there are a number of them in South Africa. Um, I know internationally and definitely in the UK they are. And this is vital, ladies, because it is not just a, a one size fits all. Do this exercise and this is going to happen. Or, you know, make sure that this you do this breathing exercise and it's going to help. It is a different thing for every single female. But... Number one, just know that while it's common, and I think that we should speak about this more because then if you know that this is happening to other women, uh, you, you will also realize that, yes, it's common, but it's not normal, right? We can help you sort this out. So go and see a pelvic health um a pelvic floor health specialist or pelvic health specialist to help you with these um, issues because we definitely can help you. Um, a, a good colleague and friend of mine is a pelvic health specialist. She saw a lady, just to, to give you guys an example, of who was struggling with incontinence. She was 46 years old. She was young, um, struggling with incontinence. She was an active runner, uh, did a lot of strength, and was just struggling to get through her sessions without leaking any urine. And, um, and yeah, she saw this pelvic health specialist for, for four sessions, and she was fine after that. And so it is not... Just, and I'm not saying that that's the, the go-to for everyone, but it's not just a matter of uh, of just doing, you know, X, Y, and Z exercise. Um, all right. And so, yeah, go go and do that. Uh, and then that is it from me. Um, let me answer one or two questions while we get Doc Pato ready um, on, and on stage. But let me ask one or two questions that perhaps came up. Uh, here is Maud. Let me show that. Um, Maud, nice to nice to see you or hear from you, Maud. Maud saying, please also touch on chafing because it's real for us ladies, especially around the bra area, um, strap and or bra strap area and skin folds. Yeah, thanks, Maud. Uh, yeah, definitely is a concern. So the key thing there is, is, is one, practice that in your long run now. So find an anti-chafe cream for me. Vaseline works just fine, right? And really put lots and lots of Vaseline in those places, in the areas that we, we where the skin is folding and in and around the bra area as well. Um, what I have also found works is micro pore tape. You can buy that from this game um, and just putting that under the, the, the really tight spots of your bra uh, to make sure that, um, yeah, that that's, also doesn't chafe in those areas so that is helpful that those do help but again we really want to just make sure that um uh yeah you're practicing that in your long run because you're going to chafe in 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 some very interesting places as you do the race um all right let me take that off there we go uh any other questions that have come up here um yeah, so let me just mention this as well. Maud is saying, um, with regards to the bra, the team had recommended the Anita bras, and she said she haven't, she hasn't looked back. Yes, they are pricey, but so worth it, um, especially for my big sisters. Don't take a chance jiggling for 86 kilometers. It will be painful. It won't be good for your breast health, um, and uh, yeah, and it and it will help your performance. Okay, Michelle's saying a similar thing around the Anita bra. So yeah, we that is excellent. All right, let me uh, get. Doc Pato on here in the meantime. Sorry, let me take, I'm trying to do uh, a million things at once. Women are supposed to be better at multitasking. Lindsay and Brad always tell me that. Um, thanks, Doc. You are doing, are you, how are you? I know you've uh, you've had quite a day, but how are you doing? I have had quite a day, but I'm really, really glad to be here, Shona. Um, it's been a while since I did one of these seminars and I've missed it. So this time I can also proudly say I, I actually attend the seminar and present the seminar as a comrade finisher, which is which is big for me. Um, Excellent. Well, let me hand over to you, Doc. Uh, yeah, you should be able okay. to flick through because they are yours, yeah. but just shout at me if you if you can't. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Fantastic. Um, really great to be with you, with you, ladies and gentlemen, of course, if you're joining. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly because I'd like to leave some room at the end um, for some questions because I think that's where we get the real value. 
Of course, context is key, as is punctuation. And some of you who attended this talk of mine a few years ago would have seen this. I'm going to give you a minute to just read the sentence. And because we're not live, I can't ask you how you pronounce it. But there's two ways that people might view the sentence without punctuation. Either a woman without her man is nothing. Or with different punctuation, a woman without her man is nothing. And of course, I'm going to go for the latter interpretation. But we're really here to speak to specifically um, considerations for female athletes or female runners um, in this particular session. And that's the context that I'm going to take. Um, these are my disclosures, but I think the one that I'm most uh, proud of really is the fact that um, my peak in, in my interest in comrades really was something that was inspired by my father who's pictured here with me last year when I finished. Um, he was an avid comrades runner and my earliest memories of running and as a family even were supporting him on the sideline um, and seconding him as a runner. And it really influenced and shaped a lot about me as an individual in terms of my love for physical activity. And certainly this comrades as a bucket list item. As Jonah mentioned, um, in these sessions and in these conversations, we really have two goals and we want to focus on two things. The first thing, or we want to achieve two things, is make sure that you arrive at the start. The second thing is to ensure that you cross that finish line once you've arrived. And a lot of the conversation or the context or the details that I'll delve, delve into, really obviously focusing on the medical matters, um, are, are centered around these two themes. So let's go to the first one. All right, so what do you need to do between now and race day to ensure that you arrive at the start, at least when it comes to medical matters? And Shona mentioned these and it's worth repeating, two things. The first thing is you need to remain free from injury. And the second thing is you need to remain free from illness. I'm gonna assume that you have qualified or that you will still qualify. And that's just a minor technicality. So let's talk about remaining free from illness. I mean, injury, let's start with. The first thing is, of course, there's a number of things um, that could go wrong. There are a number of injuries uh, that you could sustain. You perhaps have sustained some of these, or you could certainly still su sustain in your training right now. Um, injuries ranging from iliotibial band friction syndrome, from knee pain or patellofemoral syndrome, uh, shin splints, um, plantar fasciitis, or its horrible, horrible cousin, Achilles tendinopathy. And we say horrible because we know that Achilles tendinopathy just takes a long while to heal if you don't nip it in the butt quickly. Um, many of you may have experienced exercise-induced cramps. Hopefully, none of you right now are sitting with a stress fracture. Um, and of course, um, some of you may also be, be complaining of or at least experiencing any hip problems, and I hope you aren't. But these are some of the injuries um, that any runner, certainly not just female runners, of course, um, might sustain in their training. My father always used to say prevention is better than cure. And to be very honest, without going into every single individual injury, we can actually generalize the cause of most of these injuries. And most of these injuries would be caused by poorly managed load. So whether it's under or over training, Incorrect equipment, and equipment in this context really refers to running shoes. But Sean has also mentioned a really important one, although I don't list it in the injuries there, but sports bar fritz is also a really important one, and we spoke about chafing as well. Sianda, I'll come to the flu vaccine. And then um, training surface at, at may become an issue, but I think we won't focus on that now. As I said, my dad always says to me, prevention is better than cure. And again, if I'm just generalizing and talking to you about key principles about prevention, 99.9% .9 of these injuries can be prevented by a carefully curated training program. So that is a training program, and this is shown as territory, a training program really that is graduated in frequency and intensity and duration and builds in recovery sessions or days. I have to emphasize that. Um, I know in this particular sh session, Shona didn't speak much about strength training or cross training, but there is um, equivocal, unequivocal evidence, compelling evidence, um, that supports strength training to improve performance and also decrease injuries. And there's sort of various mechanisms behind that. But if it hasn't been emphasized before, I just want to introduce it now and emphasize it or support it. Strength training, even at this stage, if you're doing the right thing, of course, can add value and prevent injury even at this stage and make you strong, of course. And then I won't dwell on, on the correct equipment because Sean has really spoken to, to, to about it, but really equipment for your body type and training load. So that's I'm specifically speaking about running shoes, but of course she mentioned sports bras as well. But of course, sometimes you do all these things and still 
you get injured. So now what do you do? And again, um, I'm talking about principles here. I know at this stage, every single runner will not like it when I say rest, right? Every single runner, myself included, says, what do you mean rest? Not right now. Um, but remember, rest can mean a number of things. Rest can mean you either stop immediately. So if the pain is excruciating and severe, you have to stop now. Otherwise, you exacerbate whatever underlying problem or pathology that you have. Rest can also mean reducing intensity. So rest, if I have feel a knee niggle, I'm going to use a loose term, today might not mean that I don't run tomorrow, but it might mean that instead of doing a tempo session, um, I just do a light run slash walk run, you know, um, and that in itself might be enough, depending on the intensity of my pain. Or yes, rest might mean that you skip a session, you know, or cross train altogether. If rest doesn't help, and sometimes rest can effectively manage small niggles, um, then it's important to seek professional advice sooner than later. And by professional advice, I'm, I don't mean your running buddy um, who will give you their view and their non-medical view of your problem, um, but I mean a physiotherapist, a sports massage therapist, if perhaps your issue relates to muscular muscle, um, a chiropractor, of course, a sports medicine physician. So no, you're not going to call Ghostbusters. You're going to call one of these uh, professionals to firstly assess, secondly, make a diagnosis, and then thirdly, initiate investigations or treatments. And that's really the third step. So your investigations or treatments will really be informed by the severity of the pain, your functional limitation, did you respond to pain uh, to rest at all? And of course, the duration or the time to rest day, because what we might do will be different if you're telling me to make today that you're running in a week's time. And, you know, in my context, maybe the week in the week's time, this is an Olympic qualifier, as an example, versus if you're injured today and you've got three months until your rest day. And of course, management may include anything from physical therapy, so um, manual therapies, electrotherapeutic modalities, shockwave, anti-inflammatory medication, ultrasound, shock, you know, x-ray, MRIs, and surgery, of course, and so on and so forth. So then just to, again, emphasize, maybe just wrapping up this particular point, we want to remain injury-free and prevention is better than cure. Prevention in terms of load management, which builds in appropriate recovery, strength training, and the correct equipment slash the running shoes. So I see a lot of the questions that have come up already relates to illness. And that's really the second point that I'm going to touch on. So how do I remain free from illness or how do you remain free from illness between now and race day? So many of you will know that physical activity is actually both a risk factor and it is protective when it comes to illness. But I do want to say when it comes to risk factor, there's two key points here that really depends on the duration of exercise and the intensity. So really prolonged intense exercise is what really puts you at risk, for instance, of respiratory illness. Um, but more than anything, what we know, and again, where there's compelling evidence, is that physical activity slash exercise is actually protective against illness. Um, I won't go into details here, but exercise itself. So in terms of actually remaining injury free, what you want to do is keep moving, right? Exercise is an immune booster. And we know that it acts across the first line of defense, which is your skin barriers, right? And so clinical evidence does show that compared to people who don't exercise or don't move, people who exercise regularly have got faster skin wound, skin wound healing properties, as an example. Um, we also know that it acts against your second line defense. So we know that um, if you exercise moderately or vigorously for an hour or so, uh, the result is enhanced immune surveillance and improved second line defense. We know that after exercise, your immune cells that enter the bloodstream will firstly circulate in higher numbers. And then secondly, they migrate to the areas of inflammation and they seek out and respond to pathogens and damaged cells. So ex exercise is great, right, as a second line defense. And then maybe lastly, we also know that exercise does work as on the third line of defense as well. So from a third line of defense, there's clinical evidence that regular physical activity does affect adaptive immunity. So that's your third line um, and actually also chronic inflammation. So a good reason to keep moving. Another key one, and again, I, I always emphasize recovery um, and the non-trained athletes, in other words, um, the non-experienced athletes may not I really appreciate the value of recovery, both in terms of injury prevention, but also in terms of illness prevention. So again, recovery is an immune regulator and it works in numerous ways. When you recover, um, you, you know, your muscles adapt, you get muscle adaptation. Um, you also get muscle recovery and regeneration. And of course, uh, you top up your energy stores, all of which are important from immune regulation perspective. 
And when I say recovery, I do mean rest days or lower intensity sessions. Um, and certainly, um, I also mean nutrition. And again, I'd like to just refer you to Nikki's talk when it comes to nutrition, the, the resident dietitian. And this is pre-race or pre-training nutrition, what you consume during your training session or your rest session, and certainly also what happens afterwards in terms of recovery. There's also a few things that we use in our high performance world um, to aid with immune boosters, specifically in high risk periods. You know, so um, we often talk about uh, your, your intrinsic and your external load. So if your int intrinsic uh, response system is under strain and you increase your external load or your external um, physiological load, then often you might end up sick, right? And so, and things like uh, being in a very highly stressed work environment, not sleeping because of other pressures, that could decrease your internal immunity and your in internal sort of physiological uh, ability with, to withstand uh, any external load. And so there are little things that you can do. You can use probiotics, okay? And the important thing is what probiotic and what strain of, what strain of probiotics is, in, is included in that. And probiotics we know are, are very effective a, in um, treating and firstly reducing the severity of illness, specifically flu and colds. So it shortens the duration of illness should you fall sick, should you fall sick with flu. Um, and we know that it's effective in a number of other areas, specifically when it comes to gut health. The use of antibiotics um, has also been shown to be effective as an immune booster. And yeah, we're talking about simple antioxidants like vitamin C, vitamin E, and I've mentioned you know, the dietary intake of probiotics. We always, 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 always advocate for consuming any kind of uh, minerals, uh, macro or micronutrients first, food first, you know, and you'll hear me saying it, you'll hear Nikki saying it. But again, in high risk periods, um, supplementing with vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, and vitamin D3, in fact, um, has been shown to be effective in terms of immune boosting. And then here's a question about the influenza vaccine. Yes, um, the influenza vaccine in, in for most people is protective, but I think it's important, timing is a very important factor. Um, there are people who have taken an immune a, a influenza vaccine and have <laughs> responded very badly to it. And therefore, they say that they'll never take a flu vaccine again. Remember that a flu vaccine contains what we call a live strain. And so because it contains a live strain in very low doses, some people may then actually um, get the illness itself, right? But oftentimes with the vaccine, you will not get the illness to the extent that you would have had you been exposed without the vaccination. And so what a vaccination does basically is it helps you build immunity to that strain. So the key thing is with the flu vaccine, remember taking a flu vaccine last year might not help you for this year because we, need, we know that the strains of flu do change year on year. So every year a new flu vaccine is released. Typically speaking, we would say that we would recommend as clinicians that you take a flu vaccine sort of at the beginning um, or in the autumn season. So very much April, March and April would be a good, good time to take a flu vaccine. You don't want to take a vaccine, especially a live vaccine within 10 days of your race because what we're doing, as I said, is that you might get ill. So we don't like that. Samantha, I see that you're asking me something about, uh, okay, so folic acid, I think it's important to say is very different to vitamin C. Um, I'm trying to read the question as I go along and I'm also like showing I'm not multitasking. So what is the, the benefits of using folic acid tablets? And then you're also asking about vitamin C. So folic acid um, is basically, it would usually be recommended as a form of if you're iron deficient. So in other words, if your hemoglobin levels are low, um, you would only be taking really sort of folic acid or any iron kind of supplementation if you've had tests that then show that you've got low hemoglobin and you've gone further and done iron studies that then show that certain um, levels are low. So that's when you'd then be taking folic acid or iron supplementation. And then in terms of vitamin C, absolutely. The regular dose of vitamin C that we do take is a thousand milligrams. Um, a lot of the science a lot of the science has been done on as little as 500 milligrams, and we know that as little as 500 milligrams does have an effect. Um, but what you will find is in most formulas that you can get at the pharmacy, um, as an example, an Effaflu C, it comes in a thousand milligram formularies, and that's perfectly fine. The great thing about vitamin C is that it's water soluble. It's very difficult. In fact, you can't overdose on it because anything that you drink over and above what your body needs is basically passed through your kidneys and you wear it, you wee it out. And then, of course, um, and then, of course, there's the issue of, okay, I've, I, I do all of this, but I still get sick. Now what? 
um, how, do, how do I manage it? And so I've given you some tips there. So even in the acute phase, you can take probiotics, you can take vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D3 have been proved to be very effective. Uh, good nutrition is very important, keeping very well hydrated. These are all things that may help with your symptoms, number one, and then also the duration of your illness. Speaking of symptoms, if you do get ill, um, most respiratory illnesses are due to viral infections. And so from a treatment perspective, we don't commonly administer as a first line um, agent an antiviral, not depending on the severity, but really we just treat symptomatically. So if you've got a, a stuffy nose or nasal congestion, we'll treat the stuffy nose. If you've got a fever, we'll treat the fever with paracetamol. Um, and so we often treat symptomatically first um, before we introduce a viral agent. And so what I've shown you in this slide is some great work that is being done by the International Olympic Committee and in fact led by the University of Pretoria and um, Professor Martin Schwalness and his team. Um, and there's really since COVID of course been an increased in interest in respiratory illness, how it affects athletic performance, uh, what the cause and the root cause is and then how we manage it. And um, this is a sort of a publication that was most recent that was recently released, um, and the IOC has now taken on this as a consensus statement. And the key point really is in terms of managing acute illnesses. Um, as I said, you know, it's 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 a non pharmacological treatment to support recovery, and I've spoken to you about those. We spoke about nutritional, immune, and probiotic size supplements. Um, we spoke about pharmacological treatments in terms of treating symptoms specifically. In specific cases, and often this is when we've actually taken a, a, a swab and we have been able to demonstrate what pathogen it is, we might then give an antiviral agent like a Tamiflu. Again, if you've done a swab and you know it's an actual bacterial infection, then you will treat, you will use an antibiotic that is effective for that specific bacteria. What becomes really important um, in severe cases, of course, is we know is to treat all of the other syst systems other than the chest that are affected. Um, and then the, the last big clinical decision is when do you return to training? Um, and a lot of this, without going into detail, is informed by the severity. It's informed by the sort of the number of symptoms and the severity of symptoms, the number of systems. So in other words, outside the lungs, are there any other systems or organs that are involved? Um, we assess your ability to withstand exercise. So in other words, and tolerate exercise. And it's inform, informed by all of these criteria, we would then introduce return to sports, assuming that A, we've assessed you as lower risk, uh, B, there's no multi-organ involvement or we've been able to limit it or you're past that stage, um, B, you're able to tolerate exercise and increasing amounts of exercise, and then we return you to activity. The last one, and I think I won't go into too much detail here because Joan, I believe you have gone into detail, but perhaps I'll just spend five minutes speaking about um, factors that we need to consider and I guess tactics that we might want to uh, employ in order to ensure once we've arrived at the, at the start line because we have arrived injury free and free from illness as well, how do we make sure that we get from that start line and to that goosebump inducing finish? A lot of it is going to be informed by the state at which you arrive on the start line. So this is critically important. You want to arrive at the start of the comrades in your best possible condition, physically and mentally. And then, of course, the second factor that's going to influence your success are race day strategies. So this is um, an actual old, this, these are old entry stats, but really just to create some context, um, in this particular year, there were about 16,000 runners, and of those runners, 85% of them finished in general. Of the novice runners, while there was quite a fair pool of novice runners, so that's 30%, so a third of the field were novice, fewer than that actually finished. So in other words, 27% compared to 15% uh, did not finish of novice runners. So if you're a novice runner, we don't want you to fall into those 27%. And what we've done is we've tried to unpack this 27% and understand why individuals didn't finish by conducting a series of interviews and surveys with non-finishers. So I'm gonna shoot through this very quickly. Um, and we and I'm gonna shoot this, let me, let me just do this. There we go, let's start here, sorry, that slide is in the wrong place. So just in terms of the comrades non-finisher surveys, there, there's a number of surveys that have been conducted. Um, this was a little bit of an old survey. In fact, this was, about, I think, 2016, 2017. But essentially, um, we interviewed, or not we, but 20,000 runners were interviewed. Uh, in that particular, 18% did not finish. And, and just in terms of stat, we had very good um, participation rates, and we wanted to identify why there were dropouts. And the results basically showed a number of things. But 
firstly, many of them admitted to being inadequately prepared. And when their race preparation and their training was analyzed, um, that was confirmed. A key factor was a change in race, day nutrition and strategy. And so when we talk about training, we don't just talk about physical training um, and, you know, what, you know, Shona spoke about load and the distances you should be running, but also training your gut, you know, so, so the importance of while you're doing your training runs, testing out different nutrition, you know, um, and ensuring that your gut can tolerate that and that that nutrition will take you the duration, right? Um, we've spoken about, I hope for you, you know, that you don't ever try new, new kits on race day, specifically not new shoes. A really important one, arriving to the start line with an injury that has not been fully managed or fully treated. So you're arriving to the start line with a niggle, in inverted commas. This is one of the key contributing factors to non-finishing. And then also use of medication on race day. And I saw that there was a question about this. So really quickly, so again, this was this is now 2015, it's quite old, but I know that last year's data, in fact, the last three years' data has still only been analyzed now by a colleague of mine, Dr. Gavin Sheng. But interestingly, at the end medical tent in 2015, um, 45 athletes were treated for dehydration. Um, three of them were treated for heat-related um, illness, so hypothermia. And some of this was caused by medication. Um, and one of them was caused by an endocrine or hormone disorder that was known. But what's really important here is that most patients that were seen in the medical tent had an illness in the week before the race and were taking some form of medication. So I just want to pause there because I think it's important. Uh, most patients that are seen in the medical tents during the comrades had an illness in the week before the race and were taking some form of medication there is a very strong positive correlation with illness and using meds to ending up in a medical tent and non-finishing. So the prevention aspect is really important, as I said, and then, of course, what you do once you've actually got illness. And the complications and the consequences are dire. So three of these individuals ended up on dialysis and one ended up with multi-end organ failure. So it is not worth it, okay? It's an important race, but it's not the only race that you could, you could possibly run. Um, and I think it's important to just to emphasize that. So just unpacking then the reasons, um, again, of non-finishes, we spoke about unresolved injuries, and I think I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, except to say that, you know, 59% of the respondents who didn't finish said they had some sort of injury. So again, treating your injury, and as I said, there were a number of ways that I emphasize that you can treat your injury, resting or seeking professional help sooner than later. You know, that will be what is critical. In terms of race day injury and illnesses, the profile of injury and illnesses, cramps, okay, many of us have suffered with cramp. And the thing about cramping is if, you're, if you've suffered from cramps before, you're likely to suffer from cramps again. 44% um, of the respondents reported feeling ill, and I'll go into that a little bit uh, of detail just now. And then lastly, 54% um, complained of nausea, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, in terms of illness and nausea, it could either be a physiological imbalance, so whether it's an electrolyte imbalance or, or hormone disturbances, it could be due to mechanical stress. So many individuals, it's a question I often get, you know, when I'm running, I get diarrhea. And the diarrhea is often a consequence either of nutritional and poor nutritional strategies or mechanical stress. So again, you're interestingly race day illness, assuming you didn't come into the race unwell. One of the key preventative strategies is race day nutrition, race day nutrition, race day nutrition. And if you're not sure what that is, again, I want to just direct you to Nikki de Villiers' talk because she lays it out very uh, simply, um, but very effectively. Um, and again, if you need to seek advice, I think it's important that you seek advice either from a professional coach, but more, in fact, better still from a nutritionist or a dietitian. So I speak here about preparation and conditioning. I think I repeat myself a lot, but hopefully by repeating myself, I just make the points. Preparation is key, conditioning is key, race day nutrition and hydration is key. And very importantly, if you are feeling ill on race day, and you're feeling nauseous on race day, you need to slow it down, you need to take it easy. If your symptoms persist or they worsen, despite you slowing down, taking it easy, identifying if hydration or nutrition is an issue. So in other words, if you're feeling nauseous, it actually could be because you haven't eaten and because you're becoming hypoglycemic, your sugar levels are dropping. Great something to eat. If it's not working, then just stop off at the medical tent and get medical attention. Doesn't mean your race is over necessarily, but let them assess you and then re-enter the race. Um, 
I think I'm going to jump over this. I think using medication on race day, it's a question that I often get. Um, but the key thing here and the key culprit on race day is what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So your anti-inflammatory medications, I won't name them by name, but you know, you know what they are because many of us as runners use them. Uh, we use them when we've got a niggle and it may help your niggle. But the reality is um, they are associated with quite significant com complications especially for us backrunners. So those people who come in in the last four or five hours because we're out in the field longer, uh, physiologically we've, we've undergone a lot more stress. So your body is less capable or is compromised when it comes to um, metabolizing these NSAIDs. And often the backrunners are the ones that won't take one NSAID. They won't take one tablet in other ways. They will take one or two or three or four or five. And that has got consequences. And so it's really important to just, again, you, the better you enter the race, the better your chances of finishing the race. So, you know, to avoid them. And then very lastly, um, before I, I stop and ask a tech question, you know, we're here as females and often questions that I get uh, relate to the menstrual cycle. So should I adapt my training according to my phase of menstrual cycle? Menstrual cycle? I mean, this whole slide is a 45 minutes talk before. In fact, Sean and I have hosted a webinar that was about one and a half hours to two hours just speaking about the menstrual cycle and running. So I won't do it justice now. But the short answer is, should I adapt my training to my menstrual cycle phases? The short answer is, there's no compelling scientific evidence that says during the luteal phase, you need to be doing this form of exercise. During the ovulatory phase, you need to be doing this form of exercise. What we do say is you must train for feel. And we do know that people respond differently in their different phases of, med of menstruation. So some people feel tired in certain phases and some people feel energized. You can take advantage of that and you must listen to your body but no scientific evidence that says during this phase, this is the kind of training that I should be doing. Can I manipulate my period to ensure that on comrades day, I don't get my period? Um, the short answer here is it depends if you are on any kind of hormonal contraception. Um, and if you are, then there are things that you can do should you feel safe and, and there's no risk doing that in terms of your uterine health. Um, the short answer there is if you're on a the pill, so the combined oral contraceptive, the closer you get to race day, you just, you miss the placebo sections, you carry it on, and then you take the placebo once you're finished race day. And then the last question really I get is, should I be worried if I don't get a regular menstrual, uh, irregular period or regular menses? And the short answer is yes. For a woman who is A, not pregnant, or B, uh, not perimenopausal, then, and you have had your period before, then if you don't get a regular period, it's something that is worth investigating. Shona, I think I'm going to stop there, just in the interest of time. Um, maybe just by saying, yes, I was trained by Shona. I entered my comrades last year injury-free, and I finished. I think I peaked at the right time. I finished feeling strong, strong as ever. You are a woman, and that is your superpower. So I think while we have you know, these sessions that are aimed at females, um, it's really addressing nuances and specific questions, but know that everything that we are is the superpower. Everything that we are is what will enable us to cross that finish line. Thanks, Jonah. Yeah, thank you, Doc, as always. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've done these things with you so many times and I learned some new stuff today. So that's, that's uh, always, always so cool. So thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for that. So, um, Ladies, there were some cool questions that came through and, and Doc did answer one or two of them as, as she was going um, through. But let me just go back and 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 have a look. Um, this one was, was interesting. Doc, this is from Portia. Uh, she's saying, is it wise to use jet mm -hmm. fuel? So I'm assuming that's uh, all sorts of things in, yeah. you know, there's a lot of companies offering these um, pre, yeah. you know, IV drips and, you know, immune boosting IV drips. Um, yeah. What does what the science say on that? What are your thoughts on it? Um Okay, so any of these drugs really only work if you've got a deficiency, right, Shona? Um, often, I don't know what this particular jet fuel is, but in terms of these IV lines, often what they contain is a vitamin B complex. They might contain vitamin C uh, in these in these drugs. That's usually actually the key components. That's the common denominator, and then a little bit of fluids. And then some of them con contain one or two other things. So if you're deficient in anything, absolutely it'll help. Um, as I've said to you as well, vitamin C we know is an immune booster, right? So I've mentioned it as an immune booster. The vitamin B complex is an energizer. So many people will walk away from this IV drug feeling a little bit better, but I think it's critically important to understand what's going in to that IV drug. I think also if you're competing for medals, you must be aware of doping um, rules. 
you know, um, and there is doping rules right now that say you are not allowed to use IV drugs before uh, in, your, in your sort of pre-race period and then obviously during your race and the 24 hours after, and that's qualified as anything more than 100 mils of IV fluid. So if you are somebody who's competing for a medal, uh, and in fact, even as a general principle, I should say, we should just need to be aware of these anti-doping rules. Um, so I think to answer your question very precisely, Portia, it's very important for you to understand what is in that IV, IV drug, you know, IV fluids that you're getting and then be very conscious about what you're taking in. But if you're sick, yes, it might help. Um, I, I can see a few others, Jonas. I can just fire them off a few ones. Oh, yeah, if you, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's time to then, yeah, we'll actually save time doing that and you, yeah. Sure. You do so there's a question from Mawasha about is it advisable to go on diet to lose a bit of weight? If you're lighter weight, normally means you can yeah. go faster. So it's a great question, right? Because... <laughs> you know, the, in theory, yes, the lighter you are, the better you go uphill at least, not necessarily downhill, but you go uphill. But there's a real risk, um, uh, um, Mawasha, in terms of energy availability, if you try and go on quick, fast, or non-methodical diets uh, in any period before race day, right? Because what you're doing is you're compromising your energy input at a period where you're probably increasing your energy output, right? And so, there, and therefore, the, the, there's risk there. If you do feel you need to be, lose a bit of weight, firstly, I would just question the timing, given where we are right now. And secondly, I would suggest that you consult a dietitian. I would, I would say, Shona, my clinical opinion, and this is really probably a question for a dietitian, is now is not a good time. If we're talking about the Comrades Marathon, now is not a good time to be thinking about losing weight. Yeah. And maybe you can answer that, Shona. No, no, exactly. I mean, you 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 are um, increasing your your output, your mileage. As I mentioned when we were talking around what where we are now, I mean, this, these are your these are your biggest training training mm -hmm. months, and so um, or weeks, and 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 so we have to be giving our body the fuel that it needs in order to um, to do the work that we're asking it to do, and by losing the weight, uh, well, with the goal being losing weight, it's almost like your your benefit to risk ratio is going to be as is, is, is not going to be beneficial at all because you mm -hmm. might lose a bit of weight and might get you a little bit faster on race day but you're not going to be able to do all the training that is required now that's going to and when we fall into this low energy availability area you know we're risking injury and illness and that's all the mm -hmm. stuff that doc and i've been saying uh to to not uh to get you to race day so from from a training perspective no we need to make sure that we are giving our body the fuel that it needs to do the training that it, that is required. Um, and, and Nikki does actually touch on this in, uh, I can't remember if it was a women's webinar or I actually think it was a women's webinar. And I've popped the links in there. So, so go back and watch that one as well because Nikki goes into a lot more detail on that as well. And then just two more that I've picked up here, Shona. A question about Como, can one, can one take painkillers during racing? I think I've, I've spoken to that. And so we often say as far as possible, you must avoid painkillers and specifically NSAIDs. The challenge with saying, oh, you can take one is that often people then take another one and another one and another one. And there, the risk, therein lies the risk, you know, therein lies the real risk. So, um, you know, I, I never advocate for taking any pain meds uh, during race day. Uh, I think it's, it's, you need to be on the side of caution there. Okay. There's a question then on groin muscle soreness, and perhaps that's both for me and you, Shona, as, as a sports scientist and somebody who's also done rehab and strength. So Mawasha saying groin muscle soreness is a concern for me. How do I treat this? As a clinician who is taught by a rheumatologist, I always say groin muscle soreness is a symptom, not a diagnosis. And so for me, Mawasha, the key thing here is you need to understand why you're getting it, right? So what is the actual diagnosis? Do you have a muscle strain? Is it muscle? Is it ligament? Is it bone? that's causing this 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 uh, this pain and the symptom that you're feeling. And then once you even understand what structure it is, you need to understand why you're getting it, and then we can start treating it. So how do I treat this? This I would say to you at this particular point, go consult a professional. That professional could be a physiotherapist. That would be my first port of call. They will do an assessment of you um, and, and functionally, and obviously from a symptom perspective, and then they would be able to guide you from a management perspective so that you arrive to that start line because the way you're describing it right now, you know, you're not ruled out, certainly not by my box. Yeah, exactly. I think, I, you know, we in South Africa use the word niggle, which can be <laughs> so descriptive. It's so descriptive as runners. Oh, it's just a niggle. But as runners, a niggle could be a pain that's really, really sore. It could just be something that that's not sore. And so as Doc is saying, we have to decipher why 
to what level and extent that is, firstly. Um, and, and, and then once we know that, we'll then be able to sort of say, okay, these are the exercises you can do to help strengthen. For my, from my experience, just when people are having growing concerns, it's very often that their hamstrings are quite weak and, and, the, and the adductors, the muscles on the inside of the leg have to tend to take over and then they're a little bit overworked. Um, and so that is, that's, but again, I don't, you know, we don't want to just say go out and do some hamstring exercises. We want to know exactly what that, that concern is. Um, and because we don't want the niggle to become a, a full blown injury. So rather get that sorted now, um, because if it is just a niggling pain, because you're saying it's a concern, but, but, you know, uh, we don't want it to become a full, uh, a full blown injury. And we don't want you to be one of the 58 or 68% of people who, who don't finish. So there are exercises that we can do to help strengthen areas in and around there too because the body's a chain right so if there is a weakness somewhere so it has to take <clears throat> strain somewhere else and so that's often what happens if there's a weakness in the hamstrings it could be that the groin or the adductors uh take over but again uh, the groin and the hip girdle is a, a a complicated area so we yeah wouldn't want to just give a blanket approach to to an answer mm -hmm. there Another question here by Maud, um, who says, Doc, what about those not using contraceptions? Great question. Can, can we delay our period should it arrive on race day? And what are our options? So great question, Maud. And um, the answer is it's very difficult to manipulate your period in the absence of hormones, right? Because hormones are typically what is used, whether it's um, you know, oral contraceptive hormones, whether it's hormones in the form of injectable hormones or an IUD, so an intrauterine device, those are actually the more commonly used and safe, you know, want to say, say, ways in which a period is manipulated. So not too much that um, certainly I, and I know that the colleagues that work in sort of our female athlete group um, recommend, unfortunately. So all we can do more is plan for it. And then say, if I do get my period on race day, what now, you know, and, and how do I manage it? So yes, it's about using sort of reliable menstrual products, you know, and, you know, something that you can use for a long duration. Um, often people are very comfortable with tampons if that's what you use, menstrual cups, but only if you're used to menstrual cups and only if you're used to exercising with them, because menstrual cups can actually be worn for 12 hours. So for most of us, that's enough. But again, it's really only if you're used to it. Most people or many ladies rather don't run um, use it with underwear, uh, depending if you do. But if you, if you, you know, again, period panties, but here I would be careful because what we've repeated is you don't try something new on race day. So you don't want to start that if you've not ever run with it before. So I just, you know, I want to, to say this uh, quite, quite clearly. And then of course, it's uh, depending on your symptoms on the day, it's just managing your symptoms, you know? So again, the great thing is that exercise we know reduces dysmenorrhea. So that's period pain r related to, to periods. We know that exercise helps. But there are people who get significant dysmenorrhea and period pains and who do need to use medication. And in this particular case, before your race, so in other words, the day before is usually when we manage these with panados, um, before your race with your brufins, I say before, very intentionally. And often that, that is helpful. And like I said, as you're exercising, as you're, um, you know, you're drinking fluids, often the pain is manageable, right, uh, on, during your race day. Um, and then, of course, dressing comfortably. And again, comfortably here is you've you've trained in this gear, wearing darker, you know, tights. Hopefully, that you've trained in. Uh, I think that that's the that's the little bit of advice that I can give you. Should you do should you get your period during race day? Sean, I don't know if I want to add to that. The only thing I'll add there, Doc, is um, you know, if, if if your period arrives on race day and you you haven't planned for it at all, um, I know that Netcare, being one of the sponsors of um, Comrades from last year uh, made sure that they had uh, emergency sanitary wear along the medical routes. Um, so that is quite cool from comrades and netcare's perspective. Obviously that's, if you, you try and prepare for yourself, don't use those all along the way. Uh, but yeah, that is, that is really good uh, on, on behalf of the race that they've organized that as well. Um, do you, 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 you want to, yeah, do you want to, sorry, is there another one you want to take? Oh, perhaps maybe while we're speaking about uh, menstrual cycle and periods. So uh, Kisoma asking, getting a period during running, is this normal, especially if it was not the days for it? So here you could be talking about spotting, um, perhaps during your run. And again, this does happen to some people, absolutely, that you spot. And it's it very much is related to hom like it's hormonal influence, um, for lack of a better word. So I'm not sounding very fluent right now. Uh, this is way past my bedtime. I usually sleep by eight o'clock. But... <laughs> So A could be a result of a physiological sort of imbalance or B even mechanical um, mechanical stress or strain. 
it's not something that we would get particularly concerned about if it happens once and if it happens lightly, but certainly if it's something that happened continuously and if you're getting heavy bleeding during your runs at a time that was out of sync of your period or your normal menstrual cycle, then it would be something that we would say you, you must investigate. But small spot, like spotting, a bigger pardon, and specifically, and I'm going to get a little bit graphic detail, but this is a medical session, you know, brown spotting, not necessarily frank blood. Um, that does happen sometimes, and specifically also if you're on some kind of contraceptive or hormonal contraceptive. Brilliant. Thank you, Doc. And then, so let's just take these two more questions because your point about sleep is important and it affects recovery and we want these athletes to get to bed as well. I forget, sorry, it's half seven in London. So let, let me, let's, uh, let's just ask these last two. I'm going to ask you this first one. I'll add a bit and then I'll take the last question is, um, yeah, any advice on, on what to do if you become nauseous during comrades? Um, uh, Samantha is saying that it's happened twice to her in the last two months, usually when it's hot, um, mm -hmm. but it's never happened before. Is it hormones or Nutrition, what, yeah, what's your thought there, Doc? Common things occur commonly, Samantha, and so nutrition would be the first thing that I would uh, look to address uh, if you're feeling nauseous. So the first thing is, have you been fueling consistently throughout the race? In other words, there's things like hypoglycemia specifically might make you feel nauseous. Or if you have eaten something that you're not used to eating and you've taken it off the table, that might also re result in nausea. So so those are the two things. So again, training you guys is really important uh, for two reasons. Firstly, making sure that the things that you're consuming your gut is used to um, eating for the duration of the race. Also that you've got some variety, because here's the thing, if you are training and you're doing 15Ks, 21Ks, and you're used to just having, for instance, an energy aid, by the time you hit 50Ks, you know, A, you might be hungry and need more than just an energy aid, but also that energy aid might actually start to make you feel ill and just you're, you're, you lose your taste for your energy aid. So you need to have a little bit of variety in terms of the fuel that you use. So there must be the A, you know, the liquids and carbs and electrolytes in the form of liquids, but also try gels, also try sweets, also try nuts, also try, I mean, my, and this is just me, right? And it's different for every person. I swear by a peanut butter and jam sandwich, you know, which I carry with me when I run and then on brown bread. And then I've obviously got my energy and the other things that I'm, I'm used to on the, on the, on the route. So nausea often is a result of nutrition, you know, either undernutrition or incorrect nutrition that you haven't trained for. Um, and it can also be a result of dehydration. So I noticed there that you said that it was often happens when you're hot. So again, have you fueled enough just in terms of fluid replacements, fluid and electrolyte replacements? Uh, so that's also a key reason and a, one of the key contributors to nausea. What do you do when it happens? You slow down and you try and address it. So you try and identify any of one of those causes and, and do something small and you want it to pass. You do not, you watch for it and you do not wait for it to get worse or you do not ignore it as it's getting worse. That if it is getting worse, you go and you seek medical attention. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Well done, Doc. Thank you. You you took you took my answer there too. But uh, yeah, I was just going to say, especially when it's hot, you know, because I see Samantha saying there that she never actually changes her intake or her hydration. Um, and so I think that's the key thing. When it's hot, just to really make sure that you are taking in a little bit more water with your actual nutrition, uh, with your gels or whatever it is. So yeah, no, you 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 took you took my line there, Doc. So um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, cool. And then uh, there is a question there around: uh, Are there enough toilets um, or places where we can change sanitary wear? Sophie, so I see he's uh, he's busy. At the, he's not on anymore. So. Um, uh, that is a question for Comrades Marathon Association specifically. Hopefully, uh, he can just answer you in the chat, Marlene, um, to mm -hmm. let us know. And I'm and I'm assuming they they are. Um, so hopefully they are. And then the last question that that I'll take. So this was from Chelsea. There was also someone else who also asked it earlier. Is how long would you recommend to rest after two oceans before getting on with Comrades training? Um, so if you ran two oceans this weekend, I'm jealous. Uh, it's one of my favorite races. Um, and so that's that's very cool. Um, but it really depends on, on how you ran the race. So if you ran it like a, a training run, so if you ran it at your Comrades race pace, um, you should ideally be ready to start training um, today or tomorrow with a light session, like a really light run or a light cross training session would probably be preferable just to get some blood flowing in the legs. And then you can move um, slowly and progressively back into your comrades plan. Um, and so, yeah, I would recommend that you, you, you do that if you ran it easy. Okay. So <laughs> Really, at your comrades' race pace is, is the key point there. Um, if you ran oceans hard and you are feeling really stiff and sore, uh, definitely take a full week off, treat it like you would have after your qualifier. Um, and even if you did run it easy, 
you you want to only get back to training when you're no longer stiff and sore. I think I think that is is the key thing. Okay, so um, for those of you who who did run oceans, that's uh, yeah, very very cool. All right, um, yeah, it is bedtime. Uh, athletes need to get to bed earlier <laughs> so that they get that good natural release of hormones, that they get all the benefit of the training that they're currently doing. Um, and so, yes, let's let's call it quits there. Doc, as always, uh, I love doing these these with you, um, and especially around women's uh, sports in particular. Parting shots from you, Doc, before we we call it we call it quits. Woman, you are your superpower. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Thank you, Doc. Uh, yeah, as always, thank you for your expertise and your time um, from my side uh, and, and on behalf of, of Lindsay and, and the Coach Perry team. Um, thank you so much, ladies, for joining us. It's really, really cool to see more and more women uh, taking on this uh, the, this demon of a race um, and uh, yeah, really want to see us doing very, very well. Look after yourselves, stay injury-free, stay illness-free, um, and look forward to the next webinar, which is coming up next week, Wednesday, with Coach uh, Lindsay. He's back, and the team is back. Um, but other than that, yeah, have an awesome rest of your evening. Get to sleep, and uh, we'll see you guys all soon. See you at the start line, ladies. <laughs>